renegade master D4 damage of power to the people Back once again will the renegade master D4 damage with the ill behavior Back once again will the renegade master D4 damage of power to the people Back once again will the renegade master D4 damage with the ill behavior Back once again will the renegade master D4 damage of power to the people Back once again will the renegade master D4 damage with the ill behavior Back once again will the renegade master D4 damage of power to the people Back once again will the renegade
Dove, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Dove, you're you're on mute. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. I just had the most fire intro ever. Okay, we're gonna do it again. Okay, so what's up, everybody? Uh, I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome to the Level Up Your DC Brand from Essential to Expert Shopify Growth Strategies webinar. I am your host, Dove Carp from Chargeflow, your go-to chargeback management solution, and today. You'll be hearing from some of the most incredible and accomplished e-com experts from around the world. Over the next hour, we'll be hearing practical strategies and real-world examples from the people and brands who've been dominating the D2C space, including Daniel Monte from Senlane, Alicia Gann from Aftersell, Caleb Ulfers from he <coughs> Haven Athletic, Shani Bosian Steinberg from Allermy, Aaron Watt from Triple Whale, and Dan Moskovich from Chargeflow. So the format's going to be a mixture of interviews and presentations, along with giveaways and, that are peppered throughout, and a Q&A at the end. Uh, and with that being said, throughout the webinar, please feel free to send us any questions that you'd like the panel to answer during our Q&A discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first guest, Alicia Gann. Alicia is the Partnerships Manager at Aftersell. So with many years of experience in the e-commerce industry, she specializes in strategic partnership building and marketing and driving business growth through innovative solutions. Alicia has a proven track record of enhancing brand visibility and fostering strong relationships with key tech and agency partners. Alicia, welcome. Thank you, Dov. Appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm still like hyped up from that intro. That music was fire. I know. Okay. I was literally <laughs> dancing in the background. I love the music. <laughs> I know. I know. That was sick. All right. Um, so Alicia, do you have a presentation for us or we're going to go with some questions? I, yeah. Show me a question. I think this will okay, be a good one. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So let's just get right into it. So what are common challenges uh, that brands are facing today in relation to boosting AOV through post-purchase upsell sequences and how potentially can brands solve them? Yeah, so I think we're, we're starting from um, the challenges part is, I think maybe we'll get started on just the, the trance itself. I think this is where it gets really interesting uh, with the mm -hmm. solution. I think it would be good to kind of like add that at the end because people kind of tend, even if they're doing uh, very well in the beginning, it's a lot of the things that they're not currently doing, which I'll love to share afterwards. So we sure. have a lot of big, big brands from all different verticals right now that are doing something different uh, when it comes to optimizing their post purchase upsell. And so let's think about example, Skims, Jones Road, True Classic that are actually in the fashion and beauty industry. And so they tend to use our AI recommendations. Um, and that is actually one of our go-to options. Uh, it's something that people love to use and we do not say no to it because we have an integration with Nosto. And especially when you have a lot of SKUs, that means you have no hero product. And that also means that AI is like our little best friends. And of course, it does not need to have, like you don't have to have Nosto in order to use it. If you have Aftersell, we will have that AI feature that you can actually work well with. And we can actually track back to of the customer kind of like database of what they have purchased in the past, and then we'll show them what is more relevant in uh, in the upsell. Or you can even consider adding like a membership uh, as an upsell option. True Classic is currently doing that, and we have Inveterate integrated with us, and so they are offering it completely free. And I think this is a great strategy with True Classic coming up with that. Is that you know completely free membership? Why not consider that as an upsell? option. They may be converting a little bit lower, but the strategy is still there. It's about 2.37%. And uh, again, with after sell, what you want to do with all these upsell, your conversion rate is around 6.17%. And so that's like the best, best conversion that you can get. Um, let's think about another brand of like that is home. For example, Hexclad, that is more on the kitchen side. They love to upsell single product. And we always tell brands, don't do too much upselling. That means showing way too many products. Um, let's stick with one or maybe like multiple as a test and see which one works best. And if customer were to add like their evergreen pot, which is one of their biggest bundle set, they have a ton of bundles. Um, they would actually upsell their Hexclet pan, which is the evergreen pan. So they keep it very simple and with no discount. 
So brands always ask us like, oh, how much more discount do we have to offer? And I always say like, hey, you don't really have to do discount at all. It's not about upselling means there's need to be a more discount. In fact, no discount is a better way to convert them as well. So it's always good to do that. And in fact, with Hexclad, their average revenue is about $12 per visit. So no discount still working, and I would suggest to do that. Um, Obvi is another good one. Uh, one of, again, our brand that is currently using Aftersell. They have consistently um, kind of like, I think, added about $7.50 in every order ever since they enabled uh, the funnels. And their strategy is a little bit more interesting. They sell supplement. And so one of their Burn Elite product, I think is one of their popular product. And so when people buy them, and, and I, I myself too, I would just buy one and, and then I'll continue buying again and again every month when it's gone, uh, which is a very bad habit. So maybe do subscription if anything. So with Avi's customer base, they would kind of upsell one product of the Elite Burn and tell them like with a huge text to tell them, hey, by the way, like add something like you might want to add one more because this is going to be out of stock soon. And if not, you will have to wait for another three or four months. And so we tend to tell them like, oh, wow, this is great way of strategy because you are adding a text. It's urgency. It's telling them what they should add. And they instantly would do it. So they would test out the first is one product and three products. They like they both convert either way. So that's like some of the great ones that I've been seeing. And uh, yeah, another thing bigger brands are doing these days um, are also using one of the network offers, which is after sales latest feature, uh, which actually kind of help optimize third party offers in their thank you pages. And so they would kind of show any sort of like blue chip partners, um, think about like Hulu, Hulu Disney Plus, uh, Nike or even HelloFresh and all these factors guys in their thank you pages. And when customer engage with it, it's about 30 up to like 50 cents. And this is like pure profit that customers are generating. I mean, sorry, the brands are generating. And so it's like a win-win situation here. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, okay. We, we just have a little bit more time. And um, so of course. can we go hop into maybe the, uh, unless you want to dive deeper into the network offers, um, I, I would love to know a little bit more about it because it seems that maybe it's disjointed from the, the product, if I'm understanding correctly. Yes. But, yes, but it yes. still seems awesome. So yeah, yeah you want you want to just uh, hop into that? Yes, you're, you're not wrong. So Aftersell actually got acquired like early this year. And so it's not it's not so much disjointed. Yes, maybe because from the upsell perspective. Uh, and so we have Rock's uh, feature right now, which is who they acquired Aftersell right now, which kind of like integrated into Aftersell. And so how does that work is that, um, you know, every click when we show up in that thank you page, you'll usually just get like, all right, your order has been confirmed. But instead, you sometimes get a pop up saying like, all oh, right, you have another 20% discount for your next order, or it can be a, a little survey form and that is embedded uh, into your thank you pages. But this one is actually a pop-up to tell you like, hey, maybe like, Dove, thank you so much for your purchase. And like, uh, I would like to offer you maybe an NBA for seven day tree, uh, free trial. And like, would you select and click yes, please. And so like I mentioned earlier on the yes, please, every click is about 30 to 50 cents. And so imagine if brands that are doing around roughly 100,000 order MOV, which is like monthly order volume, they will be actually generating around 30,000 in pure profit that goes into their pocket. And, and so this is like a great addition to your revenue stream that I would say it's perfect timing to add it in your BSCM strategy. Um, it's just another way to like really no brainer. It's a one click thing. You can get it done in like 30 seconds and after sell and, uh, yeah, I, I would say in terms of like, I think a lot of brands that are a bit more worried, it's like, oh, what if, uh, you know, other verticals are showing what I'm doing? Um, well, the answer is it's not, it's highly unlikely because we, a lot of our brands are, or partners, we call them, are actually more premium and enterprise. And so, like I mentioned, a couple of the brands that we have, they're all like so different. They're not another DTC. And so this is like another great option um, for Again, revenue stream, and it's really a good time to get it tested because you want to see what is working for you and what isn't. Nice, nice. Okay. Um, and so towards the end, right, we're, we're talking about common challenges, um, yes. you know, that some brands are facing today. 
what are they facing when they're trying to do this uh, whole upsell thing? And then, and then how are, how are some ways that we can fix that? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the brands these days, they tend to use upsell when they come in, they either know what they want to create in terms of the funnels, or they would come in not knowing what to get started with. They're like, I want to do it because everybody's doing it. Or I come in like, I know what I'm doing. So let's create the funnels that we have here. And so majority of the time, I feel like, great, you have a vision, you have the strategy, let's start creating. And when you have you know, maybe like brands come in, like they don't know what to do. I'm like, okay, tell me what's your hero product. And so the hero product is the main thing we want to understand as a brand. Do you have something you really want to focus up sell? If you don't, then let's start using an AI recommendation. Maybe we can get that one started. And even with AI recommendation, we always say, hey guys, do A-B testing. And that is like the first thing ever we would tell our brands, like to make sure to A-B test, A-B test, because you want to know what's working for you and what isn't. And so a lot of brands tend to not do that. And they just go with, all right, I know what my my strategy is. I want to do that. But if you don't do A-B testing, you wouldn't know, do you need to stick with a discount or without a, a discount? Because you're so like, uh, you have a strong will of knowing that, okay, I can do it with discount and it's going to work just fine. Sometimes working without discount is also equally great. Uh, on top of that, adding maybe additional text or uh, maybe certain way of like how you want to replace, maybe we want to focus on one-time purchase to an upgrade, maybe like a subscription upgrade. That's another thing that we have that nobody ever asks, like, do you have that option? And so um, we're getting a lot of that now. And A-B testing is like one of our biggest headache that we've created we want people to start doing that i think it's like a go 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 like you should a b test before before you decide like i know my funnels and creation so that's amazing that's amazing okay um so i think that's all the time we have at the moment but uh stick around because i'm sure there will be questions for you uh but right now alicia where can people find you if they want to reach out you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm everywhere. I think my name is pretty unique. It's Alicia Gunn. So <laughs> you can find me there. If not, you can actually just email me at alicia.gunn or at rock.com or alicia at aftersell.com. I'm sorry. We have a lot of email right now, but they all work. <laughs> nice. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, and we're going to keep it moving on. And number two up, we have Dan Moshkovich. So Dan is the VP of marketing at ChargeFlow. Uh, he's been involved in B2B SaaS marketing for over 15 years. His journey is marked by his pivotal role in building and guiding the marketing teams of three successful startups with notable achievements, including two exits and an impressive IPO at a $4 billion valuation. And uh, we have another one on the way, hopefully, um, as the lead. <laughs> As the leader of all marketing initiatives at ChargeFlow, Dan continues to drive innovation and strategic growth within the company, leveraging his deep expertise to navigate the dynamic digital landscape. Welcome to the program, Dan. Thank you so much. Wow, that, that, was, uh, that was quite an intro and I had nothing to do with that. So uh, that was all on you. I, I do appreciate it. Um, yeah, well, you deserve I, it all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I'll share my screen. I do have a quick presentation I wanted to go over. Um, so... Uh, let me just uh, pull this up. So I'll be going over some of the um, ways that merchants can lower expenses and overhead uh, by reducing fraud chargebacks and optimizing their, their payments. Um, so I'll break it down into kind of three different topics. Uh, one is reducing friendly fraud, specifically chargebacks around friendly fraud, mitigating chargebacks as a whole, and then lowering uh, processing fees. Um, so for those who don't know, friendly fraud is essentially first party fraud. It's when somebody creates a, a legitimate transaction, but then disputes the transaction um, for the wrong reasons or for illegitimate reasons, or simply because they just don't wanna pay. And that's what we would consider uh, friendly fraud. Um, so just to give you an idea of the, the, the scope of the problem here, um, when we're talking about fraud. So for every dollar that a merchant loses in the, in the cost of goods sold to, to fraud, whether it's uh, pre-transaction fraud or post-transaction post uh, friendly fraud, um, it's about $3.75 um, on the dollar. So um, this comes into kind of like hidden fees, for example, um, that are associated with processing fees, uh, operational overhead, 
uh, fulfillment, chargeback fees, et cetera. There's a lot of different kind of ancillary fees that cascade from uh, fraud, and 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 that's a that's a major issue for for uh, merchants. Um, and so, sorry, wrong slide. Um, and and as a whole, the 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 topic or the the size of the problem is is. Um, it's quite big. It's about $240 billion across all industries. Um, in general, that's the kind of the cost of chargebacks. And the worst part is that it's increasing over time. We see a trend that is definitely upwards uh, and that it's, it's uh, impacting merchants across all verticals uh, in all industries. And it's something that is seemingly that's going up uh, um, quite a lot over the next uh, uh, trip predicted to go over in the, in, in the next uh, few years to, to continue increasing. Um, so what we see here is that roughly eight out of 10 chargebacks are considered friendly fraud or, or can be attributed to friendly fraud. And the worst part is um, that once fraudsters are um, successfully exploit the chargeback system, they are highly likely to repeat. So something like eight out of 10 um, successful uh, outcomes to the to the friendly fraudster um, essentially generate more friendly fraud chargebacks. Um, so what what can merchants do to prevent uh, friendly fraud and, and chargebacks related to that? Um, so the first is is to essentially use the um, standard Shopify or uh, Stripe fraud solutions that are baked into the platforms. They're essentially what we call rule engines. They allow merchants to kind of keep a track of various uh, uh, parameters uh, and um, ensure that there's no repeat offenders or things like that, that um, um, people who are exploiting the, the system are caught uh, early on, or at least flagged early on. Um, the other recommendation would be to extend the capabilities of these platforms, which are relatively rudimentary, but um, you can extend them with third-party uh, applications um, both on the pre-transaction side of things. So in both marketplaces and Shopify specifically, there's quite a lot of uh, um, pre-transaction fraud prevention solutions um, that you can install, but it's also important to install post-transaction um, chargeback recovery so that once the chargeback does occur, you can recover that revenue um, to your, back to your uh, account. Again, also continuously monitoring the data. Um, to look for unusual patterns uh, and unusual order volumes. Again, repeat offenders, as mentioned, are a big problem. So if somebody has was flagged originally for friendly fraud, the odds, and, and they became successful in, in, in that challenge, um, then uh, the odds of them repeating it are very high. So you have to keep an eye on that. And again, that goes back to uh, the post-transaction data, keeping track of the reason codes and the insights around those fraudulent chargebacks is crucial. Um, and again, this is the impact that we see in, in general in terms of chargebacks as a whole. Um, we're seeing a general increase over the last few years. It's kind of taken off uh, since COVID. Um, and um, you know one of the one of the main reasons for that is that in the last few years, it's become very, very easy for consumers to initiate chargebacks. Um, the banks are essentially facilitating this whole thing. Um, by making it easier for their consumers um, to, to initiate disputes. Um, up until, I think, five, six years ago, uh, in order to initiate a dispute, you'd have to go through an agent at the financial institution. Nowadays, you can do everything with three clicks through your banking app, um, and that reduced a lot of friction around chargebacks and initiating the disputes. And this is why we're seeing a huge explosion in, in chargebacks um, over the last few years. So... Um, as banks improve their customer service, it's kind of hurting the merchants um, in terms of the ease of disputes. Um, and uh, it's as, as I mentioned, it's becoming a major issue. Um, and, um, and, and this is, is, is causing a lot of other problems for the merchant. So um, for example, the, the, the chargeback dispute process has become very complex. Um, it requires the merchant to collect the right evidence presented in a very specific way and submitted within a certain amount of time. Um, and if anything in that uh, stage is done incorrectly, the dispute will get ruled to in favor of the consumer. So everything has to be done to the letter 
um, and um, the merchant um, doesn't always uh, have that expertise on how to collect and present the evidence as needed. And again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of fraud and abuse in the chargeback system, um, and we're seeing an increase of that. Um, and again, there's a lot of um, additional kind of overhead that's that's involved uh, in, in fighting chargebacks. Um, so, so what can be done? Again, a lot of these things are uh, I've already mentioned regarding the strong pre-transaction fraud prevention solutions, as well as post-transaction recovery solutions. Um, but it's important for merchants to store everything, um, data logs, communications with customers, logistics data, um, all these things can be used as evidence in fighting chargebacks and, and, and ensuring that you not only fight them, but you also win um, and recover your revenue. Um, so make sure that you have access to all this data and it's uh, stored and so that you can re uh, um, retrieve it at any time. Um, you know, with, within 12 to 24 months. Um, the other thing that merchants don't always uh, update or keep updated is uh, the payment terms, uh, terms of service, returns policies and shipping policies. These can and do use, uh, are used in, in evidence collection and um, during the uh, uh, chargeback dispute process. Um, you have to make sure that these are ironclad um, and make sure that um, all the different scenarios are covered in these policies so that then you can reference them as part of your uh, dispute process and, and the evidence uh, submission process. Always, again, uh, um, invest in customer service. That should be your first line of defense. Always reach out to the customers to probably resolve the issue uh, before it escalates into a chargeback. Um, that's just best, uh, uh, best practice. Um, highly recommend um, for merchants to, to go that route. Um, the other thing that where merchants can can also optimize performance is around processing fees. Again, it goes back to the the fraud rates and chargeback ratios. Um, we do see that high chargeback ratio, meaning the amount of chargebacks to transactions, um, will give you your ratio. If your ratio goes up too high, um, then you have a, uh, um, um, a problem which may escalate into monitoring programs uh, by the processors. Um, Shopify payments might, might drop you all together, say you can't process through us, you'll have to find an alternative processor. Usually those fees are much, much higher, um, anywhere from four and a half to 10%. You really don't wanna go, uh, you really don't want that to happen. As it is, Shopify payment processing fees are, are quite, are, you know, are relatively high as you can see um, in this calculation. You want to make sure that um, you avoid um, those monitoring programs and high-risk processors as much as you can. Um, so how would you do this? Um, again, going back to the fraud prevention and chargeback recovery, um, those are kind of the, the, the basics, um, but uh, there are other ways to, to lower your processing fees. Again, this is a very uh, um, high level. There's probably a lot more things that can be done. Um, but my recommendation would be to always negotiate with your payment processor, assuming it's not shop pay, they're not that flexible. Uh, but if you're using an alternative, um, always get multiple offers and compare them. Keep shopping around until you find the best rate and the best processor for you. Um, offer multiple payment methods. So alternative payments like debit, crypto, always important to uh, um, include as an option because they have lower uh, processing fees. Um, and um, incentivize your users to use those alternative payments. Um, if you're selling internationally, uh, my recommendation was to use, to use a, a, a processor that supports multi-currency accounts, and that way you can avoid uh, high Forex fees. Um, and again, as I mentioned, lower uh, chargeback ratios um, are, are crucial. Um, fee audits, again, reviewing your uh, payment processing statements um, on a continuous basis. Uh, you'll be surprised how many unnecessary fees uh, get tacked on. Uh, you can always uh, dispute those and, and get a refund uh, if possible. That's basically it. Um, that's kind of uh, um, my presentation. Awesome. Dan, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate that. I mean, as you showed, uh, there is a gold mine within the world of chargebacks that most people people are not aware of, whether it's through, uh, you know, recovering revenue or it's through productivity or it's through these other tips. Uh, it is such an important area to, to pay attention to. 
Um, so Dan, where can, where can people find you? Well, for one, um, we're, we're having a live event next week at the Shopify headquarters in New York. Uh, anyone on the webinar is welcome to, to join if you're in the area. Um, you can get the RSVP link um, at uh, newyork.shopify.com slash charge ahead. We're doing it with our partners, Triple Whale, who are also on this uh, uh, webinar. Um, I'm available on uh, LinkedIn as well. Um, so you can reach out to me uh, and um, that's it. Amazing. All right, Dan, thank you so much. Uh, stick around for the end for the Q&A. Uh, next up, we have Shani Bosian steinberg um, Shani is the CEO of Allermy, which is a brand that developed a new way to treat your allergies, which was developed by allergists. She founded the company with her father, an allergy and immunology professor at Stanford University, who'd been developing a comprehensive allergy medication. Since Allermy's launch, uh, Shani has raised over $4.7 million and grew the company over 1,000%. Welcome to the show, Shani. Thank you. Uh, let's so let's hop right in. So you you founded the company with your dad. By the way, I resonate with that because seven years ago, I did something like that, but we definitely did not get to where you got. Um, and it's a really an amazing special experience to do that. So you founded it uh, during COVID? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we um it was a great time to found a company, I think, especially like a consumer health company because telemedicine just completely exploded. Um and so, yeah, I mean everybody was home, we were all able to work remotely and we were able to help people with COVID symptoms literally like right when they needed it. So, it was kind of a really interesting time for us. Wow. Wow. So, okay, and I just want to know a little bit about the, the, we spoke a little bit about the origin story, but, but how long was your, was, was your father, I guess, working on this and when did the idea for the company start? And then ultimately, when did you, how did you go about creating and getting those first customers on board? Yeah. So um, in 1992, which is the year I was born, my dad um, was in his first year as a clinical allergist after finishing a very long period of schooling where he did an MD and a PhD and a fellowship in allergy immunology. And he started to see a lot of patients who had um, inflammation of their noses. And when your nose is inflamed inside, you experience symptoms like stuffy nose, runny nose, itching, sneezing, and post-nasal drip. We call those the five cardinal symptoms of rhinitis. Rhinitis can be caused most of the time by allergies, but can also be caused by your genetics, your anatomy, pollution, chemicals in the environment, a cold or a virus. What about a deviated septum? Deviated septum, absolutely. A nasal anatomy. If your septum is skewed one way, that smaller side will have a lot more inflammation and be harder to breathe out of. You're getting me, you're getting me psyched up right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so when my dad started to see this, he started to experiment with different solutions because what the current market was offering for people with these symptoms wasn't really effective. Most people were taking oral medications to treat this tiny little area on their face. When you take an oral medication, it has to absorb through your bloodstream. It's very slow to act. It doesn't directly target the area. So over the next couple of years, he developed a nasal spray solution that he actually became quite well known for. His name is Dr. Boshin, and so became known as Boshin's Potions. And he would prescribe these like magical mix of different medications into one single bottle. And his patients did incredibly well. And people came from all over California, sometimes throughout the country to, to come see him and get this treatment. Um, but he never thought to commercialize it. He's really a, a physician and a scientist and only was thinking about the, you know, the patients that would come to see him in clinic. And then when I realized that, you know, I've suffered from this my whole life, I'm such a like crazy allergy sufferer. Um, and then I started to meet others who were throughout the world. And I was like, wow, I use this solution that my dad gave me and it works so incredibly well. Everyone I've met who also has these symptoms needs access to this solution too. How do we make that possible? And it was just in the era where companies were starting to use the internet to make healthcare and better healthcare solutions more accessible. And so I thought, why not take what Curology and Roe and Hims were doing for dermatology or primary care and make create that within the allergy space and, and then you know also have it be a CPG company where we take my dad's formula make it our hero product and distribute this to people all over the country. And so that was kind of the impetus um, for, for starting Allermy. And we, we got our first, you know, 100, 150 patients or so through word of mouth, um, through kind of my, my dad's clinical experience. Okay. The experience of his was, it through, 
was it through his like like patients or clinic? Is he just research or does he? No, oh, he's a clinician um, okay. at, a, at at Stanford and a large multi specialty practice in Palo Alto. Um, and so, yeah, some of his patients, his colleagues' patients, and that's where we really started to kind of refine the um, the online process of what it looks like to um, you know get a prescription, receive a custom nasal spray in the mail, and receive ongoing care. That's really really cool. Okay, so. It seems like the company grew fairly rapidly over the past couple of years. Um, what were some of your main KPIs that you used to to measure that? Yeah, I think you know in the beginning we were really focused on establishing credibility as a company. When you're a healthcare company and you're prescribing medication to people who have like a chronic health condition online, I think credibility is characteristic number one. So far ahead of of anything else, ahead of price, ahead of brand. I mean, credibility is obviously part of brand, but in terms of um, kind of uh, the um, values that were important for us to establish in the beginning was was uh, success of treatment and credibility from our physicians. And so to do that, we had to treat a lot of people and have a lot of people talk about how effective Alarmy was and how um, it was side effect free and how they had safe and positive experiences with it. And so that early like trajectory of high growth was really crucial to us because we needed to collect a large base of people. We couldn't afford to do steady and slow growth in the beginning. So what we did was we offered a free trial and that worked really well to convert people. It was also, it also really reduced our acquisition costs. And so we were able to grow fairly rapidly um, just by ha ha uh, being able to spend more on a larger group of people, sorry, spend less on a larger group of, of new customers. Um, so for a year, we offered a free trial. We were really focused on keeping CAC down and month over month growth quite high. And from there, we collected thousands and thousands of patient testimonials that spoke to the efficacy, to the safety, to the positive uh, customer and patient care experience. And I think that was really the main factor in our early kind of explosive growth. We're using ads to, to grow it? Or yeah, is this we organic? Were using, no, this was, we used paid social. We wanted to be able to track and measure everything and we wanted to be able to demonstrate scalability. So right from the outset, we decided to use methods of growth that we would scale over time and whose early proof of concept we could pitch to investors as this is the scalable solution. We've tested it, we've we've measured it, we've A-B tested it. And, um, and this was what will demonstrate our scalability in the future. Okay, so, so I I, so I was looking on your your social and you have some, some really solid content um, so uh, what, you know, what, what's your view on social media content uh, and kind of what type of content is getting the best reception from you? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. For us, social media content, organic content has not been a large driver of growth at all. Um, it's been, mm. I think it's important because people will go to your social when you, when they see an ad and you have to demonstrate again, especially for us, that credibility, that kind of, um, uh, there, there's a large population of patients who are using this and who are safe and who are doing well. Um, and so I think it's, you know, to show our physicians faces and to talk about medication and allergy from an expert perspective has been really important for us in terms of building credibility and trust, which of course indirectly affects our growth. Um, but in terms of a method of acquiring user bases, even our most viral videos, we got one kind of Instagram reel that went viral, um, barely moved the needle. So, so what's what's the I guess the number one um, driver for your for your growth these days? It's creative testing. Yeah, running a ton of ads, testing creatives against one another, um, focusing our creatives on efficacy and credibility. Most of our creatives feature our one of our two founding physicians, one of whom is my dad. They're in their lab coats. They're speaking from a, a very clinical and evidence based perspective, and then we just create like dozens of versions of each ad and test them against one another and find the winner. Nice. Amazing. All right. I, I wish we had, I wish we had more time, um, but we got some questions at the end for you. Um, and yeah, so um, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me Shawnee or Shani Boshin Steinberg. Um, yeah. Contact me there if you wish. Amazing. Okay. Is it Shawnee or Shani? If you're American or is from <laughs> elsewhere, it doesn't matter. It's, you pick. <laughs> okay. Nice. Depends on where uh, I am in the world. I hear you. I hear you. Always got to keep people on their toes. Yeah. Um, amazing. Okay, great. So now we have 
uh, in the last webinar, we saved it to, for the best for last, but now we're just having it just right up there, right up front. Um, and I told you this, uh, this uh, was really going to be an epic webinar. So let's start off with the giveaways with a bang. The winner of the MetaQuest 3 goes to Alec Termain. Alec Termain, congratulations. Uh, you hope you really enjoy this MetaQuest 3. Uh, a team will be in touch with you after the webinar. Okay, next up, we have Daniel Monte. Daniel is the Director of Customer Success at Sendlane. With over 10 years of experience in brand growth and customer, ten customer retention uh, before transitioning into SaaS, Daniel worked with notable companies like Snow Agency, True Religion, Scentbird, and Good Habit. He successfully implemented retention and marketing, marketing strategies for these brands and is on a mission to help DTC brands thrive in the competitive digital landscape. Daniel, welcome to the show. Oh man, hell of an intro. <laughs> you deserve it, man. You deserve Thank it. You. Especially with those like those baller uh, headphones, man. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta change up the color. You, you make it pop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. So we got something sweet here. I'm going to share my screen. Let's get this going. All right. All right. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, really, really super excited to be, you know, a part of this webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about unifying email and SMS for a uh, multi-channel revenue strategy. And we're going to be honing in on the evolution of retention marketing. And what do I mean by that? Well, in the beginning, it was always email versus SMS marketing email or SMS marketing, which channel is better. And what we found over the years is that the two really work best side by side to deliver a great customer experience. Now, great customer experience, right? What is it? Well, A, it's the brand connecting with the consumer and, and building that trust. And once the brand is able to actually build that trust, the customer then starts becoming an advocate, right? Speaking about the brand in different rooms, right? Whether that's a, a Facebook group or a Discord group or in their own, you know, social circle, right? Uh, as they're speaking about the brand and, you know, appreciating the product, they then become a loyalist right? And that loyalty could then lead to growing business because by simply speaking on the brand and sharing it on your IG stories, you know, or your, you know, TikTok, you're creating awareness for that respective brand. And that can then lead to creating more sales. Now, customer experience, when we look at retention marketing is the future for email and SMS. And, you know, simply put, customers, they want to be treated the way they want to be treated, right? Gone are the days where we have this fixed approach on what we think would work within the retention landscape. And we really have to start creating a strategy based on behavior, based on the behavior of the customers and the cohorts. Now, here's a quick fact, right? Your playbook, nine times out of 10, unless you have like a retention marketing guru, your playbook is probably 10 years old, right? Super outdated. It's time to get updated here. It's time to change things up. Now, let's talk about the old approach real fast. Now, as I talked about the beginning, right, of like email and SMS marketing, we talked about, you know, an email, a platform dedicated for email marketing, a platform dedicated for SMS marketing, right? Which platform, which channel is better? But then that created this divide where you have two separate platforms and then that created issues. What issues are we talking about? Well, A, for the retention marketer, they're not really able to build this cohesive strategy because now the data is just separated, right? And then B, if you know, you're know you a brand and you're working with an agency and you signed up for email and SMS marketing, now you're getting hit with double attribution, right? And it's inflated. The numbers are inflated here um, unless you're using like a last click tool like a triple well, right? So keep that in mind. It led to a lot of issues from an execution perspective. You might be sending an email campaign around the same time you're sending an SMS campaign. Super wonky. Now it's all about changing things up, right? Um, and so as we start talking about the evolution of things, one of the most important elements of retention marketing is pre-purchase, right? And the pre-purchase funnels. So let's talk about lead gen, right? The old way is one standardized pop-up, 10% off coupon, 
you submit your email address and bam, hello, buy now, one day later, buy now, right? Just hard selling right out the gate. Now the new way is sort of building that connection and that trust with the customers. And so A, pausing right there, you have multiple uh, lead gen opportunities. You not only have you know the, the, the standardized welcome unit, you also have an exit intent. You also have an opt-in at checkout. You also have the opt-in within the footer, et cetera. But then when we're talking about email and SMS orchestration, you now have a, an automation that's really A, honing in on both of the channels and leveraging them. And then from the back end, you have like the data, right? To, making sure, to make sure that we're grouping the audience based based on their behavior. So um, someone signs up, the first thing we're gonna do is make sure that we add them to the respective, uh, add tagged, right? To just call out the fact that they're in the respective journey. And then from there, we start providing information. A, here's what you've requested. Um, and then from an SMS perspective, how can we support? But then not only are we providing what they're requested, we're providing additional information, such as the story about the brand, the mission about the brand, right? Of course, we can lean on a reminder of purchase, but we're also gonna provide instructions or the results, right, of the product, just so that people can feel uh, like they're making a good decision. And then from there, we can lean on what we know to work well, which is uh, FOMO, time is running out, final notice. And then at the very end, we would sort of dictate uh, the tag that they would receive based on their behavior. If someone did not engage and they did not purchase, then they'll be moved to the dormant list. And if someone you know engaged but they haven't purchased, they'll be moved to the newsletter list. And what's really important here is that you know the customer is sort of dictating what their experience would be like uh, for the brand moving forward based on their behavior. Now, another important element, especially when we're talking about the pre-purchase automations, right? We talked about the lead gen and the welcome, but there's also the abandoned cart. Now, the old way here is someone signs up, bam, you forgot your product, go to the website, shop now, right? Pretty bare bones. New ways more so including that dynamic content to recover the lost sales. And so someone signs, someone, you know, abandons a, their item to their cart, they're going to get the, the tag placed, but then they're also going to receive an email. That email is going to include dynamic imagery of the product. It's also going to include the dynamic links. There's going to be a, a good delay time. And then from an SMS perspective, you have the, the link and the urgency there, right? Now, if someone still hasn't purchased, we do want to provide you know, an educational piece about the brand or about the product. And then there can be the discount attempt afterward. But in addition to that, we have the brand and the story, discount reminder, last chance, et cetera. All this to say, in a nutshell, we're not we're not only providing information regarding the product, right, the imagery, and you know, making it personalized, but we're still providing more information about the business. Now, last but not least, number three, we have the evolution of the post-purchase automation, right? Which is the welcome experience for anyone who has purchased one time or more, right? And so the old way someone makes a purchase, bam, 10% off coupon, check out, check another product, right? Uh, just immediately trying to get that next sale. Uh, the new way is sort of leading with storytelling and education, right? And so uh, someone purchases, we're not only going to make sure that we include, you know, what's to come and checking out a new product, but we also want to make sure that they're set up for success. We want to make sure that we're providing them with information such as the order has shipped, a brand story and mission, it, and instructions on how to properly use the product, right? And seeing how we can possibly help, right? Since we have Haven Athletic, right, on the call, like I'm a big fan of Haven Athletic, got two bags, man, right? And so one thing I loved about Haven Athletic is that when I purchased, I received a letter from the founder, right? At least it seemed personalized to me and I freaking liked it because I'm a, I'm a retention marketer, right? So I'm like, shit, right out the gate, I like this, right? But I felt like they cared, right? And it wasn't only conveyed within the automation experience, but also just regarding the brand itself, right? From a social media lens, right? And that then led me to getting my next product, right? So big fan. And so shout out to Haven Athletic, right? But all in all, it's all about that personal touch throughout the customer touch points. And yeah, 
that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I do want to quickly say that while I have everyone's attention, the Commerce Roundtable in San Diego is September 23rd and the 24th, right? So the biggest D2C event of the year is back, right, at the Port Pavilion on Broadway Pier in San Diego. And for anyone listening, you use the code SUMMER25 and you get 25% off tickets, right? Uh, but yeah, thanks, Dove. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. That was um, that was amazing. That was absolutely jam packed. And I want to have a conversation with you afterwards. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like like legit. Um, OK, cool. Where, where can people follow you? Where can they find you? Yeah. So I am all over the, the, the place. Right. So on Instagram, Daniel Monte, D-X-N-I-E-L-M-O-N-T-E. -E, right. On LinkedIn, Daniel Monte, if you want to shoot me an email, dmonte at sendthelane.com. And um, yeah, just, you know, let's chat. If you want to talk retention marketing, I'm here. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure there's going to be a thousand questions we have uh, a little later. Uh, next up, I mean, I don't even have to give an introduction because uh, Daniel really set it up, but we have Caleb Ulfers. So Caleb is the co-founder and CEO of Haven Athletic, which we've established is an amazing brand, according to everybody and the panelists. Uh, as a visionary business leader, he ignites growth and fuels innovation. He's founded and scaled multiple ventures across events and software and is currently upending the stagnant bag industry through Haven Athletic's patented organized bags. Caven is dedicated to building Haven Athletic into a nine-figure brand providing high-performing athletes with the ultimate bags. Caleb, welcome. Thank you for having me, Dov. Okay, I have to know the inspiration to start off for the bag because in a previous life I was a videographer and I'm looking at your bags and I'm like, oh man, why haven't people thought of that before to make non-camera bags? Yeah, usable department, you know, compartments. So what was the what was the motivation? Yeah, I, I mean, we started this in 2017, you know, and it's kind of a classic startup story. It was my own problem. I'm a multi-sport athlete across individual ath uh, athletics, like running, hiking, biking, CrossFit. And I was in the gym digging through my gear. I couldn't find my stuff. I literally emptied my old duffel bag out. I pulled the plastic piece out of the bottom and my headphones were like tucked under there. And I was just like so frustrated with that moment because I'd been doing it, you know, day after day, like you throw all your stuff in your bag and then you're like just digging for like, where the heck did I put that? Where's where you're leaving? And you're like, where's my freaking keys? And like, you just have these little like, piss me off moments I'm getting PTSD from playing baseball back in the day just you know, yeah even when I start there. talking about it I can feel myself start getting like more worked <laughs> up <laughs> yeah um and so we had I had this moment in the gym and uh and then I was just like man there's got to be something better and uh we looked around and we did some research I was working with my brother who's one of my co-founders and didn't find anything we brought a friend into it and started concepting started doing um market research lean startup development and that's kind of where like my <clears throat> background comes into play where I've, I've done this in tech, I've done this in services. Um, and so doing it in e-commerce was kind of the same thing where I was like, let's follow this like lean startup or design thinking pathway of, you know, we have this problem, but rather than just going and making a, making a product, you know, does anyone else have this problem? Okay. They do. Now, how do we solve it? Like, here's some ideas on how to solve it. Okay. This one works. This one kind of doesn't, uh, you know, whatever. And then kind of go back to the drawing board and then take it back to them because it was my problem. I, I inherently knew a lot of the issues and a lot of the ways to fix it, but we still wanted to validate. And so that's what the path we started going down and kind of how we ended up with our first duffel bag. And then the rest is history. Amazing. Amazing. So, uh, yeah, you took like kind of that tech iteration back background and, you know, provided it for this, uh, this current endeavor. So yeah. what were some of the initial growth activities that kind of helped you get your first several clients, customers? Yeah. Yeah. Customers. Um, we did uh, influence. We've we've been and have been doing uh, influencer seating, and we started off by just getting the bag in the hands of some really cool people. Um, there's a couple things that really helped out with that. The fact that it's a $350 item lends itself to being able to work with influencers in a more fluid way, as opposed to, you know, if you have a lower price item and you're looking for reviews and video and content, you're typically going to have to pay them to do something. You know, you're looking at 250, 500, a thousand bucks for like a post or a story or something along those lines because uh, the product's expensive and because there's no other product out there like it. We have a patent on the design um, and no one had ever seen anything like this. And so that kind of lends itself to being able to work with influencers in a pretty unique way compared to the rest of the market. Okay, so um, yeah. How did you reach out to them? 
Meaning, how did you connect with them? What was your message? Was you like, hey, here's a bag. And 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 what and what level are, are we reaching out to? Is this like, you know, Derek Jeter or is this, uh, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so early on and even now, basically, we get a lot of inbound because no one else has made anything like this. And because when you see it, it's so visually striking. And because people, so we say we're the organized bag for high performance and professional athletes. And we say that because the people at the top of their game are always looking for a 1% improvement across everything. And so when they see a bag that can keep their gear organized and they know they have that same feeling of like, where the heck are my keys or my headphones or, oh, I hate that moment of digging around, you know? And so they see a solve for it and they're like, whoa, I want this. And also like, I'm willing to give you like a free quick video or shout out for it. And so basically we started getting inbound from people. The first one was John Weeks. He's a long snapper for the Houston Texans. Uh, and he's been super supportive ever since we started. He's he's filmed a bunch of stuff. He's given us tons of shout outs. He's in our affiliate program. Um, but he was like, dude, this is dope. And I was like, like in our DMs on Instagram. And I'm like, whoa, this is like a professional athlete. Like, oh, hey man, can I like send you a free bag? And then basically that has, has grown over the course of time where early on it was just like, you're really cool. Like you're a professional, like let's get you a bag. I don't care if anything comes out of it. Just like, here it is. Just the, just knowing that you have it is super cool to me. And then it's grown over time to a point where we've been gifting it to more and more people and more and more people have filmed videos and, and photos and given us content and done full on photo shoots with us. And so now we're at a point where we still do seating, but we do require videos for most people, unless it's top tier, you know, at this point, it's like, you know, Michael Phelps, Apollo Ono, Lil Wayne, Deion Sanders, Steve Aoki. Like, I mean, we could just like go on like Clay Thompson, like go on with like people who have the bag. We're not working directly with them because the people at those highest levels, we're still doing that initial strategy of like, Hey, just get them the bag. And like, if they use it and we never know, that's still awesome. If they use it and they're like, this is so cool. We would love to actually like work with you a little bit or do something or do some promotion. Like Jorge Masvidal is a, is a top, uh, top fighter and he got it. And he's like, this is dope. Can I get more for my team? We want to custom brand them. And I'm like, hell yeah, of course you can. And so like things like that still happen pretty regularly. Uh, and that's kind of how the, the whole influencer seating thing has worked. That's unbelievable. So would you say that that specifically works? Um, you're saying for more uh, kind of higher end um, products, um, you know, if, if we have a large audience, how would you suggest that they kind of go about it? Let's say maybe they're just starting to get into it um, or maybe it's a, a lower end product. Yeah, I think there's two things about it. The, the higher end product definitely helps. Um, but then the other thing is the product market fit. If you're starting a supplement brand, um, and this is no shame, like starting a supplement is, supplement brand is great. I have friends who've started it and they're running eight figure businesses in, in a matter of a couple of years. Um, but like most supplements are exactly the same as the other 400 supplement brands out there. And so when someone sees it, when a, when a, uh, influencer or athlete or whoever sees it, it's, it's literally the same, or like you've changed one thing. You're like, Oh, we added taurine and we're revolutionary. And it's like, in all, in all reality, like you're not revolutionary. And it's, it's based on like how the market responds to you. Cause if it was revolutionary, all of those people would be like, oh my God, I got to get my hands on it. Like all doing the same thing that they're doing with us, where it's like, this is the only version of this that exists. It's absolutely incredible. It could be potentially life-changing. I want to get my hands on it and I'm willing to trade you a lot of value for that. Um, and so I think that's kind of tough. Like if you want to replicate our success, you got to have something really unique, either the high price point or that like extreme product market fit with your product. So it, it sounds like your product was just the the right thing for the right people at the right time. And yeah. and it it you said you said it was kind of a lot of inbound. I guess like maybe the the players start, you know, they bring it to practice and then all of a sudden they're like, dude, that thing's awesome. Where where did you get that? And then they're like, Hey, can I get a bag? Yeah, just reach out to cable dude and he's, he'll hook you up. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That, that that's definitely kind of happened. a little bit like how Yeah. And in general, that's like our product lends itself to word of mouth where you know, we've targeted CrossFit as one of our early pillars because I'm a CrossFitter. And then last year we became the official bag of the CrossFit Games as a kind of like pinnacle of this, of this building in that space. And 
when you go to a CrossFit gym, you have your bag and it's there and everyone else's bag is not as good and is not organized and CrossFitters, you know, you, you say, how do you know a CrossFitter? And it's like, oh, they'll tell you. Um, and CrossFitters love to chat. They love to be like, I'm a CrossFitter. Here's all these things I do. I track my macros and I work out really hard and like, I'm super healthy and I get it. Like there's a stigma. Um, but the thing about it that's great is if you have a great product, they're going to share that with all of the people around them, with the people in the gym, with the people that are hanging out. Like, dude, I just bought this bag. Like, it's actually really incredible. You should check it out. And so it kind of lends itself to that. And there's there's other products that are even more that way. Like you think about like a, a shoe brand or something. And it's like, oh, now it's not just the bag you brought in the gym. It's the shoes that you're wearing around the gym. It's the shoes that you're wearing maybe even outside of the gym. Um, and so there's other products that even have a better version of that than what we have, but we still get to capture a little bit of that, like, you know, word of mouth, um, interaction. Okay. So, um, you, it sounds like you talked a lot about the, uh, kind of the, the influencer marketing growth. Are, are there other areas that you're exploring to kind of, you know, push the brand or, or is that kind of the main driver? Uh, so yeah, what, what we got started with was like influencer seating, Facebook ads, um, a lot of like high touch across social media and, um, emails and just like being in touch with customers. And we still try to do a lot of that today. Um, and I think we do a pretty good job of it, but as we look at going forward, you know, we're, mm -hmm. is that kind of what you're, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. Asking? I'm like, we're, yeah, you know. For end of 24, 25, what, where's, where's the future of, uh, of Haven athletic, especially when you're, um, you know, continue to grow. And scale? Yeah. So I think, I mean, we continue the same things that we do, but then we kind of just like double down on what's working. So Facebook ads work for us. We generally have a really good marketing efficiency ratio or blended ROAS, whatever you want to call it. Um, it works well for us. Like we often hover around three to five X on that. Um, and that's impressive too, because we're generally looking at, you know, net new customers. Like we're in the customer acquisition business, not the retention business. We do have a pretty good returning customer rate, about 10%, which is surprising considering the overlap between the backpacks and the duffels, which are our core products. Um, but, it, it, you know, with that in mind, we're still looking at capturing new people largely. And so to, to have good ads. And it kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier about like product market fit and having a really mm -hmm. unique product that also lends itself to being able to have ads acquiring new customers at a really good ROAS or MER, whatever you want to look at. Um, so like we're doubling down on that. We're doubling down on um, content creative for that to be able to start scaling that even more. Um, you know, even though it works well, when we start to push really hard, sometimes it starts to break. And so we're kind of constantly trying to fiddle around with it and make sure it works. Uh, we're still working with a lot of influencers, um, a lot of influencer seating, a new thing that has popped up for this year, which, you know, we're not, we're not trying to bring on, you know, 20 new strategies, like, uh, you know, we're a sub $10 million brand. And, um, I think, you know, from all of the advisors and smart people I have in the space ahead of me, you know, it's like basically just like find something that works, stay focused, keep your head down and keep just like working on it until you start to, until it like breaks, you know, until you're a $20 million brand and you just can't get another dollar out of it, then look at adding something else. So that's kind of the, the lens that we take, but that's one of the new, cause I would, uh, yeah, no, ahead. just real quick. I, I was just thinking there's so many upsells, you know, in different types of products right. that potentially you can have or partnerships that I'm just, you know, just thinking about in so many different types of ways and industries and, and fields. Uh, I feel like you, you've really found something incredible, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, and that's kind of, you know, one of the things that's popped up recently for us is uh, B2B like corporate gifting sales. Um, we can do custom logos at the factory. Um, and so we've had companies reaching out saying like, Hey, like instead of, you know, a supplement company, instead of giving our products to our top tier influencers, which one of them that we're working with works with some of the biggest influencers in the world right now. And they're like, you know, we could just send them a cardboard box and be like, Hey, here's a bunch of things like, you know, yay. Uh, and they're like, it just kind of sucks though, you know? And so they're like, we wanted to level it up. So they emailed me and they're like, Hey, like, what if we put all our supplements in your bag and then sent the bag to these people? And I was like, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I would love for you to put your products in my bag and then send it to your top people. And, uh, and so they did that and it, and it worked out great. You know, they custom branded it, um, and, uh, and then filled it with their products and then sent it out to people. And, and they were like, this is really cool. Like I'm getting more product from this company that I love. Um, but then also I'm getting it in a gift that is worth, you know, three to $350 and is also, you know, unique. And is also like, if you're on the internet, if you're on Instagram, you've probably seen at this point, a top athlete or a friend or one of our ads where you're like, I'm kind of heard of this Haven. And then you get your hands on it. 
And because we overbuilt it, which is also kind of the follow-up to having that like initial spark and the cold DMs and the and the one percent better and all of that is like it also has to like resonate. And you know, four years deep into this, it resonates because when people get their hands on it, they're like, whoa, these guys like really overbuilt this. We did. We spent three years developing it, really thinking through testing and trying. Um, even a, a period of six months early on where we were like messing with the internal foam structure to make sure that it would actually stay sturdy and standing up over a long period of time. And we found some foams that would kind of like crumple. And I was like, you can't, you can't sell a $300 bag that after six months starts to do this and kind of looks like garbage. And so like, we literally spent months of time trying to figure that out and landed on something that actually works. And, you know, over the course of years stays sturdy and strong and really durable. And so when people get it, it also like backs up all of those claims. They're like, whoa, this is actually really dope. And then that goes back to the influencers where, you know, they get their hands on it. And now it's not even like, oh, they sent me something I need to post. They're like, oh, they sent me something. And I fuck with this, like straight up. They're like, this is dope. I have no problem. Like we have several athletes who are like, yo, straight up best gym bag in the world. Like wouldn't touch anything else. This is what you need to get. Amazing. 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 Caleb. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, I, you I bet. But saying it to everybody, I wish we had more time. But uh, you know, we try to keep <laughs> it moving. We'll have to get you back. Um, I love so, it. Caleb, where can people where can people follow you? Uh, I'm on most social platforms at Caleb Ulf, U L F, just the first three letters of my last name. Um, and then uh, the company is Haven Athletic, no S, <laughs> uh, and that's the same thing on most social platforms. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Caleb. Uh, okay, everybody. So we are now at the part we, we where we have a giveaway. So three winners are going to win a $100 gift card. And those three people are Sonia Walia, Adina White, and Thomas Foster. Again, that's Sonia Walia, Adina White, and Thomas Foster, congratulations on your gift cards. Um, you know, we will be in touch with you to make sure you get those. Moving right along, we have Aaron Watt. So Aaron is a dedicated sales and management professional. And, oh, and she currently is the tech partner manager at Triple Whale. Uh, with extensive experience in business development and account management, uh, she has demonstrated success in building strong client and vendor relationships through consultative, consultative, that's better, and solution-based selling. Known for her motivation and self-starting attitude, Erin excels in identifying marketing opportunities and consistently delivers quality results on time. Welcome to the show, Erin. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, so let's hop right in. So can you explain, uh, uh, we, got, we got a little bit of a presentation? Yes. Um, Absolutely. So we put a little bit of a presentation together for- okay, fantastic. Uh, for you guys. So um, excited to jump right into it. Please. And can everyone see my deck okay? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you again for that intro. And whether it's the morning or afternoon or evening where you are, I am delighted that you could be joining with me. Once again, my name is Aaron Watt. I am one of the tech partner managers at Triple Whale, and I am tuning in from Toronto, Canada. So just a special shout out to any of the fellow Canadians joining us today. And today, I'm also very excited to share some insights on how our brand scaled from zero to 4.5 million in just a year, and that you can actually replicate this type of success. But before I do jump into that, let's clarify a common question that I tend to get about us is that what exactly is Triple Whale? So I see Triple Whale as your e-commerce BFF. It's really your ride or die companion here to celebrate your business success, as well as helping you to tackle those unforeseen challenges of your online store. So Triple Whale is your all-in-one analytics tool that consolidates all of your data into one user-friendly centralized dashboard. It also integrates with major ad channels and platforms like Shopify, Google, Meta, and tools like Sendlane and ShipBob so that it can provide you with a really holistic view of who your customers are, where they came from, what they bought, and of course, how much it costs to acquire them. So just really quickly, we are very proudly to be the source of truth for 20,000 plus Shopify, Shopify plus stores, and just a few of the amazing brands that we get to work with every single day include Olipop, Chamberlain Coffees, and Milk, just to name a few. 
Okay, so now that everyone has a better understanding of triple whale, let's dive into the exciting part of the presentation. So how did create a health and wellness brand manage to scale from zero to impressive 4.5 million in just one year? So in today's presentation, we'll really focus on create um, creating gummies and their marketing strategy that helped them scale from that zero to 4.5 million in their first year. So whether you are a growing brand or you're already very established in the Shopify ecosystem, I feel these insights will help to inform your marketing strategy for 2024 and 2025. So our first insight for today from uh, Create is generating monthly recurring revenues with subscriptions. So Dan, the uh, co-founder, really emphasizes the importance of offering subscription options, even if your product isn't naturally suited for subscriptions. So the strategy is really essential for monetizing customers over an extended period. So rather than relying solely on those one-time sales. So if you're still a little bit unsure about adopting a subscription model, consider that about half of Create's revenue comes from monthly subscription. So if you haven't implemented a subscription tool yet, or maybe you're exploring some new options, um, companies like Recharge, Yapo, or even Smarter really do serve as an excellent and user-friendly subscription management solution. Our second insight from Create is focus on $100 AOV. So Dan really highlights the significance of increasing AOV as a key strategy for them. So Create achieves this by bundling products such as offering two or three months supply of their creatine gummies in just a single order. So this approach not only simplifies logistics and marketing efforts, but it also does boost profit margins. So by promoting higher order values, there is less need to attract as many customers to achieve the same revenue. And the starter pack, which I've included in the slide, is just a really great example of an effective product bundling strategy. And if you're all sitting here unsure where to even start when it comes to bundling, I have provided a few options to get you started. So the first, consider beginning by just analyzing which of your products are the most frequent purchased together and bundling those. So for example, your lip liners with those lipsticks or maybe a bodysuit with a certain style of skirt. Another approach is to offer that limited edition variation of your best, best selling products. So that could be a limited edition lipstick color, seasonal items, or even new product flavors. And lastly, you can always reach out to industry experts to assist you with bundling promotions. So, you know, just companies like a Rebuy or even SearchSpring offer excellent tools that can help brands to create unique buying experiences, whether combining multiple products with the help of data science intelligence or even allowing your customers to customize their own bundles. And on to insight number three from Create, launch a new product during a high intent period. So, Create unveiled a new flavor. So theirs was Blue Raz during the holiday season. And this refreshing twist on their marketing strategy really leveraged customers' anticipation and set the brand apart from their usual discount offerings at other times of the year. So as surprising as it might seem with everyone, especially with this insane heat wave that we're going through, the holidays are just around the corner. So if you do have a new product offering in the pipeline, maybe consider saving one or two for a launch during Black Friday, Cyber Monday, just to capitalize on the customer anticipation and consumption. So to ensure a really successful new product launch, here's a little bit of an inside tip. Involve your customers in choosing your next product. So a couple of ways you can get your customers involved, engage with you know, your communities on platforms like TikTok, Instagram, or Facebook, and create polls and surveys to directly ask your customers what they're looking for in the next launch. So this approach not only increases the likelihood of the product selling out, but it also enhances customer loyalty. So a couple of examples that I've provided to engage with those customers, utilizing TikTok's 1 billion active community members and take advantage of their interactive features. So features including their Q and A's, their polls, or you can even add a call to action to your videos that links them to a post-purchase survey so your followers can fill that out. Um, you get interactive on Instagram. So integrate a question sticker into your Instagram story to receive responses regarding new launch ideas, or even round up your Facebook group communities and create a poll to see which product idea is the most popular. And our fourth insight from Create is a gift with purchase for Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So really kind of sticking on to that Black Friday, Cyber Monday trend. I do think this is a great strategy. Um, not only 
Is this going to really help you get in front of your customers? Um, but it also is going to really enhance the customer engagement as well, too. So when, sorry, let me just get on to oh, my next slide. Um, so with the Black Friday and Cyber Monday, I really do think that it's important to, you know, to create a gift with purchase that is going to provide um, a lot of excitement. So, you know, receiving a limited time edition, such as like a hat or t-shirt, not only boosts that brand loyalty, but it also turns your customers into brand ambassadors. Personally, I love a gift with purchase. I think that it really stands out because customers are just so used to seeing that like 10, 15, 20% off promos during the time of year. And I think that brands that really spice things up by offering that valuable gift with purchase can definitely really stand out. And on to our last insight for today. So just balancing the top line growth and your healthy margins. So create strategy is really just centered on like driving maximum top line growth while also ensuring healthy contribution margins. So they just really focus on optimizing both product sales and profitability, as well as balancing aggressive market, market acquisition and like careful financial management. So there was a lot there. I think that like, let's just kind of like break this down. So we'll first kind of start talking about like just driving that maximum top line growth. So really we're looking at like aggressive market acquisition, product innovation, as well as customer experience. So when it comes to the market acquisition, Create Gummies really kind of aims just to capture that significant mar market share by just expanding their customer base. So this will involve like target marketing campaigns, strategic partnerships, as well as exploring new sales channels. And then when it comes to your product innovations, just constantly developing new and exciting gummy products to attract and retain customers. So this is gonna also like help to keep the brand refreshing and also very appealing. And then customer service, um, which is so, so important, just enhancing that overall customer ex experience through like excellent service, just a very user-friendly website navigation and easy purchasing and subscription options. Because as we know, happy customers are more likely to return and also recommend the brand to others. And then when we look at ensuring a healthy contribution margin, we are looking at cost management, price strategies, and effective supply chains. So when we talk about cost management, just keeping products and operational costs in check without compromising on quality. So this can include like negotiating better deals with suppliers and just optimizing manufacturing processes. When it comes to your price strategy, just setting prices that reflect the, the value of the product while also ensuring profitability. Now this can include like involving premium pricing for those unique products or being just more competitive with your pricing just to attract more price sensitive customers. And then lastly, just efficient supply chains. So just really streamlining those supply chains to reduce costs and improve delivery times. So this just will ensure that products reach customers quickly um, and more efficiently, and then you're just enhancing satisfaction and reducing returns. So for example, utilizing an automated system for like inventory management, order processing and shipping, this will just reduce those human errors and also speed up those operations. And then lastly, we have the balancing uh, growth and also financial management. So Create really does emphasize the importance of being able to make data-driven decisions. So really utilizing a data analytics tool that can provide you with real-time data, think triple whale, um, just to help you make more informed decisions about marketing spend, product development, as well as like inventory management. Um, this is going to help you not only identify profitable opportunities, but it's also going to help you to avoid those costly mistakes. And now we're going to look over at like the profitability analysis. So just like regularly analysis, um, analyzing the profitable, the profitability of different products and sales channels. So this is just going to help you in focusing efforts on the most profitable areas and make those unnecessary adjustments on the less profitable ones. And then finally, the sustainable growth. So just focusing on long-term growth strategies that avoid aggressive tactics, just preventing from financial instability and also protecting your brand reputation. So really to help you kind of maintain the balance and also manage resources, it's really important to use the dashboard that can consolidate all of the metrics for a comprehensive view of your sales, your marketing campaigns, and also your customer behavior.
So I know that was a lot to take in, um, just to kind of summarize everything that we presented today. So if the brand does, if your brand does have a product that can be offered as a subscription, definitely explore offering a subscription model. Focus on increasing your AOV in every possible area. Um, launch new products during high intent periods. Stand at, stand out against the crowd by offering just a juicy gift with purchase this holiday season. And then also balancing top line growth and healthy margins by staying on top of your brand's key metrics. Once again, a data analytics tool like Triple Will can really help you make this easy. And I do find that if you put any of these strategies into practice, as well as using the right tools and data at your fingertips, you are going to position your brand in the perfect um, for a lot of success in 2024. If you did have any questions, you can reach out to me at AaronWattTripleWill.com. And just really quickly, we do also offer um, a free analytics tool that you can also use. So if you did want to just see if Triple Whale was the right fit for you, or maybe there were some budget constraints for expanding your tech stack, um, you can go to this QR link and it will take you to our Founders Dash so you can actually try out Triple Whale for free. Amazing. Aaron, thank you so much. That was really, really valuable. Okay, so... Um... We are now, Aaron, you hear me? Sorry, yes, I am here. No problem. No problem. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Uh, it was Aaron Watt at triplewhale.com. Um, so thank you so much for that for that presentation. I think uh, I think our audience is really going to get a lot out of it. Um, we're now going to transition to the Q&A. Um, we got a lot of questions uh, from the audience out there. And uh, I think we're just going to, wait for everybody to come on and then uh and then we'll kind of just give it out to the crowd and whoever feels like uh answering it and uh let's go for it so uh the first question is what are some key strategies for scaling a d2c brand on shopify that have proven successful across various industries and i want to i want to emphasize on that because you've all given uh, amazing um you know tactics that that many companies and brands have used but sometimes it's hard to be like okay they use that but how do i apply that to mine so is there any kind of maybe general strategy that that you've seen uh that you, people have done to to kind of scale their brands anybody yeah um i think you know we are in the the era of AI, but like really kind of automating where possible. So use automation tools, you know, as I mentioned, like for inventory management, for customer service, for marketing, not only will this going to save you a ton of time, and also a lot of these tools will provide you with templates as well too, that you can duplicate into your own workflows, but also it's going to help to reduce a lot of those human errors. So I think automating, no matter what vertical you're in, that is going to be a huge step up to help you scale as a DTC brand. Yeah, and I will probably say um, from a retention marketing perspective, there no matter what industry you're in, there there's just like these core strategies you should be using. Uh, and so like from an automation perspective, right, you want to make sure you have your pre-purchase, your welcome series, your abandoned cart, your browse abandoned turned on. You want to make sure you have your post-purchase, your win back, your sunset automation turned on. And then from an email execution, you know, you can, if you're trying to figure out where to start, you probably want to start along the lines of, you know, three to four emails per week. Um, and then from there on an SMS side of things, maybe two to three SMS messages to make sure they don't go out the same day, sort of like rotate, um, a B test as much as possible. I believe Alicia was, was bringing that up, you know, that it just, it's not only for after sales across the board, a B test, no matter, you know, which channel you're using, um, try to learn as much about your customer as possible. I would always try to lean on creating a document that would then create like the different archetypes per cost, uh, per, per, you know, per customer, right. You have your cohorts, right. Um, and then just let that, you know, sort of make your life easier, right. Like from a retention perspective, 
if you sort of know, okay, emojis and the subject line is going to increase the open rate, well then add that right to your, to your document so that you use that, you add that to your arsenal from a campaign perspective. If you know, it's a certain strategy below the fold that's working for email, you want to make sure you add that to your arsenal as well, right? Over time, your life is going to be easier because you're going to know what works and you're going to know what doesn't. Um, and yeah, you can just continue to innovate and continue to, to figure out different opportunities along the way. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so to kind of, you, you mentioned the idea of kind of like learning about your customer. Are there certain types of uh, analytics that you use and any of you that kind of help you understand your customer better? And then that can help you market to them and personalize a bit better. I tend to look at like the, the opens, right. And so like if, if it's email, you want to make sure you're looking at the open rate just because of the copy. Copy is so freaking important. And so like, you want to make sure that like, you you know, what's getting people to open those emails. So at that point, you could figure out what's going to be the format. Okay. This type of subject line works great. How do we create more of it? And then from there, after you, you collect the open, what's actually driving the clicks. And after you look at what drives the clicks, what's actually getting the conversion on the home page, on the, on the website, sorry, not just the home page, but the PDP, et cetera. And then from an SMS perspective, what's a good format, right? I always like lean on wireframe. And it's not just with an email, but what's the, what's the secret sauce, what's the wireframe within an SMS that works? Is it screaming the alert, like the FOMO first, right? Within SMS, it's going to drive the open opens with the SMS and then like having a call to action after, is it flipped, right? How does that work? Sort of like adding that to your arsenal. Um, I would also say too, like, you know, seeing what works from like a lead gen perspective. And so you want to make sure that you have like a good opt-in rate. So from the pop-ups, opt-in rates, right? You want to make sure it's at a certain level, 3% plus, depending on if it's desktop or mobile. Um, and then like the floor is like attribution. Retention should be generating about 35% of revenue month over month. Now, the tricky part there is just that like, where is it coming from? Before, we used to always say 20% is email marketing, 15% is SMS. But then over time, we started to see that shift. And I remember being at True Religion when I actually seen that shift, where email, when I came in, email was dominant. And then over time, SMS became more dominant. But it doesn't matter as long as you're making that 35% plus. And I think that's like a big... Um, thing to focus on, especially like when you're looking at, when you're trying to communicate the C-suite, right? Because if they see that SM, that email plummet, they're like, hey, look, we're not doing too well. No, no, no. We're just providing a preference at the end of the day, right? It doesn't matter where they're purchasing from, as long as we're still getting that 35% floor. And then we start adding on all these different um, channels within retention, low UT, mobile app to, to generate more. But yeah. Nice. Amazing. All right. And, and here's the last one. After you've listened to everybody else, sometimes the juices get flowing and you start thinking of any ideas like, oh, man, this is a great thing. Is there anything that, uh, I don't know, maybe Alicia or Shawnee or, or Dan that you heard from somebody else that was like, oh, this is something that uh, that I potentially can use? Um, yeah, I think I was just hopping off from a call as well earlier. It's so interesting how, you know, when brands you hear, I think I want to shout out with what Daniel say, everything it's like right on top there, because I'm pretty sure he has done a lot of data analytics on this. And so it's the same thing, right? You really have to narrow down who your customer base is. And some of the time founders will be like, all right, here's my customer base, because I want I'm doing subscription, I want to focus on just subscribers, it's like I want to push one time purchase, and to become a subscriber. And that's a perfect way to do it with uh, the post purchase upsell portion, you can actually do that with anything that on the one time purchase, you can kind of like push them on the subscription side. But if they're not doing it, that means something is we can switch it up. It's really not a problem. And that means we can kind of work into the obvi version. Like I was saying, why not just sell one item and then we sell them another one or two item after that in the upsell by saying like hey right now we just need you to add more because it's going to get out of stock and I don't want you to wait a little bit longer than that so these are some of the ways that I feel like some people find subscription a little bit more tough it's because you need to do the refunds and so that is something that brands do not want to do and deal with as a problem um, but yeah I think these are some of the, th the key things that you're hearing brands that are constantly looking for ways to to build their or AOV or even just in revenue perspective. And yeah, these are these are some things. And Shani, do you have anything nice. that you want to add? <laughs> Probably threw her the curve there. No, I think you covered everything. 
awesome. <laughs> amazing amazing okay everybody thank you so much and um and now it's time for the platform giveaways first off i want to give a big thank you uh to everyone here at chargeflow uh, for putting on another really great webinar. Uh, if you want to forget about chargebacks and win more disputes than ever before, please feel free to reach out to us at chargeflow.io. We would love to speak with you. And as a special gift on behalf of Chargeflow, we will be giving away $100 worth of platform credits to 10 special, wonderful people out there. So please watch your emails to receive your prize. Um, and additionally, um, some of the other presenters offered, once again, I'll mention, uh, After Cell, I believe, has a three-month free trial for anybody who signs up. Uh, Send Lane has that Commerce Roundtable in San Diego. They're giving 25% off with the code SUMMER25. And Triple Whale has, I believe, that free analytics tool. So make sure uh, you you follow up with those. And uh, and with that, I would like to, you know, you all to just, I want I would really want to thank everybody out here. You know, I want to thank the guests. You were absolutely amazing and give everybody a round of applause. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your day to present so beautifully and really help the D2C community level up as we continue to kind of march through 2024 and beyond. Uh, and of course, most importantly, thank you to the uh, attendees. Uh, we really appreciate your time and we hope it was beneficial and deeply informative. And until next time, keep leveling up. See everybody.